Good morning. morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I wonder, is there anyone here who is, or let's just say, considers themselves a well-rounded athlete? And all the spouses are like, no. That is somebody who can do a lot of sports good, right? So if you're that person, you are absolutely nothing like me. If you know my history, I was good at certain sports. I was a martial arts professional for a while, so you got to be kind of athletic to do that. But there are certain sports that I am absolutely horrible at. It's been proposed that we start a golf ministry here at C3 Church. And so the idea would be is that you'd get everyone suffering from, let's say, depression or lack of self-confidence, and they would just go golfing with Pastor Gene. They'd feel wonderful. We're not going to do 18 holes. I have too many Bibles to read, too many people to counsel. We'll just go to the driving range, right? Is that what it's called, the driving? We go there. It'll be about five minutes. You'll feel wonderful. Cut down on my counseling time and everything. (laughs) I don't golf. One thing, though, you definitely don't know about me, probably, only my close family knows, is that I'm also horrible at baseball. And that can be dangerous. Like, absolutely horrible at baseball. As a kid, it's hard for me to recall ever hitting the ball. Ever. That's kind of depressing. But in my defense, the professionals, if they get it right one-third of the time, they're doing really good. I can't think of another job where you can do that. Imagine that. I come in, Gene, you're doing great. You're doing your job as a pastor about a third of the time really well. Right? Imagine that one. So that's in my defense, but my dad used to get really frustrated with me. He'd be like, come on! He was one of those parents who's trying to coach me, and I'm sure he was really embarrassed, and I'm positive he tried to trade me in. <laughs> I'm sure of it. I'm totally sure he tried to do that. But he'd be coaching me, like overcoaching. And one of those parents are really annoying. Overcoaching me, overcoaching. He'd get really frustrated. I'm striking out. And, you know, it's like, Dad! It's not my fault. You made me this way, right? (laughs) So I'd blame him. Speaking of blame, you knew I'd get to a story, right? (laughs) I heard a story about a center fielder. Is that the right position? It's in the middle, right? Center, center (laughs) fielder. And he was just messing up royally, just not getting it right at all. So finally, the coach gets really frustrated with him. He says, you know what? I'm going to do this. And the team's like, huh? You know, they're practicing. Not a real game. Like, he's an older guy. And they're like, you sure, coach? You want to do that? Yep. Puts on the baseball hat. The mitt gets out in the field. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> so fine. Batter up. Boom. Pops the ball up. And it lands at exactly the right angle and distance to pop up and hit him right in the mouth. <laughs> so now he's like missing a tooth or something. And they're like, whoa, get the coach off the field. This is no good anymore. He's like, No. He's like, tough old guy. I'm going to keep playing. Okay, next guy gets up. Crack, line drive, right at his eye. He falls down. They think he's dead. He gets up. Can't even see out of the eye anymore. He's like, no, I'm going to keep going. Like, you're crazy. Now, I can relate to every single one of these things in the story. (laughs) Just to let you know. Had them all happen, especially the next one. Really embarrassing. Crack. The ball goes up, comes right down at the guy, but now he can't see out of one eye. The sun's in his eyes, and it goes right over the glove and hits him in the other eye. Had that happen, right? So the sun is always in your eyes when that happens. And now they take him off the field. They're like, forget this. So he, they get him back to the dugout, and he can see well enough to approach the center fielder, grab him and say, you idiot! You've messed up center field so bad that even I can't fix it. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about blame a little bit this morning. If you're new, if you haven't been watching online, we are in a series called The Rest of the Story, and we're going to be in it forever. 
Okay, I'm just, <laughs> just remember, there's a lot of Bible to read, right? But we are about honoring God's word here at C3 Church. It's very, very important to us. And what we have going on in the world a lot, especially the church world, is we kind of like hit the fast forward button on God, right? Or we interrupt Jesus a little bit. We're like, oh, we really like this part, but then not that, not that, not that, not that. Oh, this, this story's cool. Everybody knows it, but not that, not that, you know? And we draw the simplest applications that won't bother anybody on a Sunday morning. In fact, they flip it the other way. They want to make you feel good about how you're messing up, right? <laughs> so you're striking out. Great job. You know, one-third of the time you're a Christian. Awesome. So <laughs> that's what people want to hear. But that's not how the Bible reads at all. So we honor God's Word. We honor the text. And a part of this series is developing a culture of that, which is important, which is taking a look at all the parts that people don't want to look at all the time. And we're seeing some great things, especially at Bible study. Light bulbs are going off. People are really starting to get it. Imagine that when you honor God's Word, good things are going to happen. Wow. So that's what we're all about here. That's what we are doing. So to recap... We've been seeing the fulfillment of Elijah's prophecies. And so if you've been in church for a while, you've probably heard of Elijah, right? He gets taken up into heaven in the whirlwind, the chariots, all that stuff. So that's him, that guy. You can go back and you can watch the messages. You can catch up. It'll take you like yeah, about a year and a half or so and watch all the videos <laughs> and catch up to this point. So what we're seeing here, and this is why it's important to look at larger parts of the text so we can get the story we know what's going on, and it makes sense, because it's been a while, but this is all connected. So it's important to like get the full picture here. I've given you that illustration. The way most people read the Bible would be like watching like one minute of a movie once a week. <laughs> by the time three years went by, you would totally forget the beginning. And that's really what happens. So this is a fulfillment of Elijah's ministry. It's really important. He's going to do that through Elisha. So now he's already been taken up in the, in the whirlwind. He's anointed Elisha to succeed him, and then Elisha will begin to fulfill some of this stuff. So he's going to appear today too. There's King Haziel, who's kind of annoying to Israel and Judah. And now we're going to run into the third person fulfilling this. So we looked at Haziel of Aram two weeks ago. He killed Ben-Hadad. Now we're going to get to a part in the text that's kind of confusing. Normally, I'm like, oh, it's simple, guys, and then I try to make it simple for you. That's usually what I do, and everyone's like, no, you don't at all. But, <laughs> but anyway, I try my best to make it simple. Here, I'm going to give everybody a pass. <laughs> the names are ridiculously confusing, and Bible translators do nothing to help you in that at all, whatsoever. So when we get about half-ish through 2 Kings 8, that's where we left off last time, we start to get introduced to some people. One of them is Joram or Jehoram, depending on what Bible translation you read. Well, wait a minute, there's also one of those in Israel. So we're going to get a little teachy today, but it's okay, I'll, I'll get back to preaching. I want to show you a chart here and I just kind of ripped this one off the internet. I can't take any credit for it at all. So <laughs> uh, where it's dark, those are like, oh, this king's better, or this king's worse. So don't pay attention to that. Also, they don't line up with one another in parallel on a timeline. So it's not like you can look at it and go, okay, straight across, that king is the king. North-south is like a civil war we're having. But if you notice, and I don't have my glasses on, so I can't read that. But you'll see that Joram appears in Judah. But... In Israel, there's also a King Joram. Then there's an Ahaziah in Judah. But then there was an Ahaziah in Israel. <laughs> They're different people, not the same king. So it gets terribly, terribly confusing. And so some Bible translations will say, oh, Jehoram. Joram says in the chart, same guy. <laughs> so they try to change him sometimes, try to make it less confusing. But then it gets more confusing. So you get a pass. It's really difficult to keep it all straight. So here we are talking about the kings of Judah. Now, we had Jehoram in Judah. Also, quick note, this one I did make. Not the drawing, though. I explained to you why. Inside joke. <clears throat> you have different books of the Bible running in parallel, and that gets really confusing. They're detailing the same account, 
but they'll give different details. Today we get a lot more in 2 Kings, so that's where we're going to stay. Robert, you could advance that slide. Thank you. And he'll leave it up. Ooh, he's very kind this morning. Normally he leaves that there just for a little while to torture me. All right. So here we are, 2 Kings 8, starting at verse 25. Ahaziah, son of Jehoram, or Joram, began to rule over Judah in the 12th 12th year of the reign of King Joram, or Jehoram, son of Ahab. Remember the wicked king of Israel. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem one year. His mother was Athaliah, a granddaughter of King Omri of Israel. That's the guy who founded Samaria, if you've been following along. Ahaziah followed the evil example of King Ahab's family. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as Ahab's family had done, for he was related by marriage to the family of Ahab. Ahaziah joined Joram, son of Ahab, in his war against King Haziel of Aram. So there's that guy is appearing here at Ramoth Gilead. When the Arameans wounded King Joram in the battle, he returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds he had received at Ramoth. Because Joram was wounded, King Ahaziah of Judah went to Jezreel to visit him. Sometimes Judah and Israel are at war. Sometimes they're not, so that is one of these times. They're making these alliances, and they get warned through the prophets, yo, don't make these alliances, they're wicked. So if you noticed on the chart, we won't go back, that most all of the kings of Israel are evil. And then every once in a while in Judah, you get one who's like good-ish, kind of. So if we turn the page, we're going to get introduced to this person. We'll see Elisha appearing back in the account, so these prophets weave their way through these accounts of the kings, 2 Kings 9.1. Meanwhile, Elisha, so hang on to everything we just read. Elisha the prophet had summoned a member of the group of prophets. Get ready to travel, he told him, and take this flask of olive oil with you. Go to Ramoth Gilead and find Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi. Call him into a private room away from his friends and pour the olive oil over his head. Say to him, oil over his head, it is probably olive oil, say to him, this is what the Lord says, I anoint you to be the king over Israel, then open the door and run for your life. Okay, you get what's going on here, right? Joram is the king. And so Elisha, by the Lord, is going to anoint Jehu, who's like this army commander, to be king instead. So this is going to be kind of crazy. So he goes and does it. So Ramoth Gilead, we'll get there in a minute. This is kind of on the border of Israel and Aram, so they're just fighting here. And so that's where the army, army officers are. Joram got taken away to Jezreel because he got wounded. So the prophet does it. He goes into the room <clears throat> where Jehu and his friends are hanging out, and he says, I have a message for you, Jehu. He says, who? You. Brings him into a private room, does exactly as he's told. Pours the oil over his head, anoints him king, but he adds some stuff. Was that a bad thing? No. Elisha could have told him he is a young prophet, so he's speaking on behalf of the Lord. And he gives him these instructions. You are going to kill all of Ahab's family. Ahab's family. And this includes Jezebel, the wicked queen. You're going to kill all of them. So that's his mission. And then he reiterates a prophecy that we've heard a little bit before. Dogs will eat Ahab's wife Jezebel at the plot of land in Jezreel, the city where he's going to go to, and no one will bury her. Then the young prophet opened the door and took off. (laughs) He got out of there. Jehu goes back to his friends, and they're like, what did that crazy person say? Because he's just running around with olive oil everywhere, pouring on people's heads. (laughs) So Jehu at first, and it reminds me of the anointing of Saul, Jehu at first doesn't fess up to it. He's like, ah, you know how a crazy person just babbles on like that. So similar to Saul and his, and his uncle when he asked him what's going on, but different because they don't believe him. They're like, no, you're hiding something. What did he say? And he says, he anointed me king. And so immediately their reactions to spread out their cloaks, it says, on the bare steps, blew the ram's horn and say, Jehu is king. So now he goes out on his mission. <clears throat> and he tells the guys there, hey, don't tell anybody. He's going to do so kind of covertly, but then it doesn't make any sense because he's rushing at them. All right, so he has this whole, I guess, company with him of, of his soldiers, his officers, and he's going towards Jezreel. So he's coming off the battlefront, going to Jezreel, where he knows Jehu is, and also 
Ahaziah's visiting with him. Jezebel's there too. So he's racing toward them. Watchman on the wall sees him and says, hey, there's a company of soldiers coming. All right. Joram says, send a messenger, a rider, out to find out what he wants. The rider approaches them, says to Jehu, do you come in peace? Jehu says, what do you know about peace? Fall in behind me and absorbs the messenger. So they send another one. Same exact thing happens. What do you know about peace? Fall in behind me. Now the guy on the watchtower is watching, and he's like, they're absorbing the messengers, and he's driving like a madman. It must be Jehu. And so this kind of gives us a window into his personality. He's fairly aggressive, and people know it. So he's coming at the city. Now, strange thing to do, but Joram and Ahaziah get in their chariots, and they go out to meet him. <laughs> now, Joram and Ahaziah, they go out to meet Jehu. So they get there, same thing. Do you come in peace? Jehu says, how can there be peace when your wicked mother Jezebel's around with her idols and her witchcraft? Now Joram knows he's in for it. So he spins his chariot around, tries to flee. Jehu shoots an arrow, gets him right through the back and through his heart. This should remind you of how Ahab died. Remember the random Aramean soldier shoots the arrow and finds its way in a chink in his armor. So he dies. Then... <laughs> He goes to his officer and he says, because all this is happening now in the area of, like, let's just say Naboth's vineyard, if you remember that account. And so he recalls the prophecy and he says, throw his body out here and fulfill that. So this is Joram, leave it here. So it fulfills that Naboth's vineyard prophecy. Then King Ahaziah of Judah notices what's going on. He tries to take off too. Jehu says, shoot him. So he gets shot. He kind of lasts a little while longer to Megiddo, and then he dies, and he's given an honorable burial. Okay, so now here's what it says, 2 Kings 9.30. When Jezebel, the queen mother, heard that Jehu had come to Jezreel, she painted her eyelids and fixed her hair and sat at a window. When Jehu entered the gate of the palace, he shouted, she shouted at him, Have you come in peace, you murderer? You're just like Zimri who murdered his master. So she's recalling what happened. King Omri was after him, which was her grandfather. So Jehu, so she's like this kind of wicked Cruella de Vil kind of character, right? She's got to be classy and everything when she's about to die. So Jehu looks up and says, who's on my side? There's a couple of eunuchs there. And so they look at her and they throw her out the window. She falls down, dies, blood spatters everywhere. That's not enough for Jehu. He tramples her body with his horse. <laughs> then he goes and gets a bite to eat. What else would you do, right? So goes inside, gets something to eat. And when he's done eating, he goes, you know what? Go get that cursed woman. Bury her, for she was a daughter of a king. They go out to find her, and this is gruesome. But all that's left are her hands, her feet, and her skull. And it fulfills the prophecy of Elijah. And she'll die there. They won't, there won't be anything left to bury. So if we turn the page, 2 Kings 10.1, Ahab, so he's dead already. Jezebel, his wife, dead, had 70 sons, busy guy, living in the city of Samaria. So Jehu wrote letters and sent them to Samaria to the elders and officials of the city and to the guardians of King Ahab's sons. He said, the king's sons are with you, and you have at your disposal chariots, horses, a fortified city, and weapons. Like, you can fight. As soon as you receive this letter, select the best qualified of your master's sons to be your king and prepare to fight for Ahab's dynasty. Just one more chart map thing. Okay, <laughs> I'll give you a visual. So you see how Jehu is traveling along. So he is writing from Jezreel to Samaria, which is the capital city. So this is kind of his path. He's not quite there yet, but the 70 sons are in Samaria. And so he's telling them, he's writing a letter from Jezreel to Samaria saying, get ready. Get ready for war. We're going to fight. This guy likes to fight a lot. So they freak out when they get the letter. They're here. Oh, we killed two kings. We can't handle this guy. So they send her a letter of peace. We'll do whatever you say. We won't make a king. Be nice. <laughs> he goes, hmm, well, I'll leave you alone if you send me the heads of all 70 of those sons. This time, tomorrow, basically. So they do. 
They put them in baskets, and they bring them to Jezreel and present them. So one of the messengers sees it. Jehu, they did it. He's like, pile them up in two heaps at the entrance of the city gate. He goes out the next morning, and he does something kind of clever, as brutal as he is. He says, listen, this whole conspiracy is on me. I conspired against my master. I decided to do it. I'm taking the blame for that. But who killed all these? So now they're joined with him in this conspiracy. Continues killing Ahab's whole family. Now, <clears throat> and now the 70 sons, if you've been paying attention, if you remember Gideon's son, Abimelech, how many brothers did he kill? 70. So he recalls these things. It's nice to stitch them together. So now here's what happened. 2 Kings 10, 12. Then Jehu set out for Samaria. Along the way, he was at Bethekid of the shepherds. He met some relatives of King Ahaziah of Judah. Who are you? He asked them. They replied, we are relatives of King Ahaziah, dead. We are going to visit the sons of King Ahab, dead, 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 and the sons of the queen mother, dead. Take them alive, Jehu shouted to his men. And they captured all 42 of them and killed them at the well of Bekethet. None of them escaped. Ahaziah's family. So here he's going a little above, he wasn't told to do that, above and beyond. He's very, very zealous, likes violence, some would say a little out of control. Now just as a side note, if you go to 2 Chronicles 22, you're going to see some of this there. But again, we're not going to do that, the account's much shorter, but this is where they're running in parallel there. Now a really interesting thing happens, which is kind of worth noting, I want to point this out to you. Uh, because it really shows you the value of being in the Word or like knowing it really well. Because now a guy named Jehonadab will just pop into the story. And you're like, where did he come from and what's the point? And it doesn't seem to make much sense. Jehu's like, are you as zealous for the Lord as I am? And he says, yeah, sure. So come on up into my chariot. He's basically saying, let me show you something. It doesn't seem to make much sense. You're going to see him in the next scene, Jehonadab, but who is this guy? Where does he come from? If you're in the Word a lot, it'll sound familiar, and you'll say, oh, I think that's somewhere in Jeremiah, like Jeremiah chapter 35, because they're talking about the faithful Rechabites, right? So that's his dad's name, Rechab. And they mention him as being very zealous, right? So you think about it. These prophets are not there to deliver good news. They're saying to Judah and Israel, you're bad. They're pronouncing judgment on them. So they make a special note of the Rechabites. And so Jehonadab is dead at this point in the story, but he's used to highlight how faithful these people are. So they basically do what I would call like a Nazarite vow. They're not drinking any alcohol and also says they live in tents. So they just live in tents and they're just very faithful and they're following Jehonadab's example. So this is in the story to tell you, look how incredibly zealous Jehu is, even in the face or presence of this guy, this faithful Rechabite. So that's why that's there. If we keep reading though, 2 Kings 10, 18, then Je so he gets to Samaria, then Jehu called a meeting of all the people of the city and said to them, Ahab's worship of Baal was nothing compared to the way I will worship him. What? Keep reading. Therefore, summon all the prophets and worshipers of Baal and call together all his priests. See to it that every one of them comes, for I'm going to offer a great sacrifice to Baal. Anyone who fails to come will be put to death. But Jehu's cunning plan was to destroy all the worshipers of Baal. So make that story short. He's in Samaria, sends out the messengers. They come. The temple of Baal, the false god, is filled with all kinds of people. So he tells like the keeper of the wardrobe, essentially, put these robes on all the worshipers of Baal. Then he furthermore says, make sure there's nobody who worships the Lord here. Get him out of here. So then he makes a sacrifice, and after the sacrifice, he orders all his men to kill everyone. So that was going to be an alternate name for the sermon, Jehu kills everybody, almost. <laughs> Likes killing. So he kills all the worshipers of Baal. They destroy the whole temple. They throw their bodies out. They level the place so that it becomes a toilet. This is a public toilet, even to the time of writing this account. 2 Kings 10, 28, in this way, Jehu destroyed every trace of Baal worship from Israel. He did not, however, destroy the gold calves at Bethel and Dan. So those are the ones that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had caused Israel to sin with. So that was a doubling down of 
Aaron's sin in Exodus 32. Nonetheless, the Lord said to Jehu, you have done well in following my instructions to destroy the family of Ahab. Therefore, your descendants will be kings of Israel down to the fourth generation. But Jehu did not obey the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He refused to turn from the sins that Jeroboam had led Israel to commit. Now, if you're just popping in, Jeroboam is the first king of Israel that appears there. So if we jump down, we get a summary, 2 Kings 10.34, the rest of the events in Jehu's reign, everything he did and all his achievements are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. When Jehu died, he was buried in Samaria. Then his son Jehoahaz became the next king. In all, Jehu reigned over Israel from Samaria for 28 years. So we see a lot of things all coming together, right? So right from Elijah, it all comes full circle right here. Elijah's prophecies. We have mentioned, as I said, of the Jer Jeroboam's calves, the gold calves that they're worshiping in Bethel and Dan. The prophecy and punishment going all the way back to Naboth's vine vineyard. The punishment of Ahab, his sons, his family. His son dies like Ahab does. His entire family is wiped out at this point. So, we see here that the family of Ahab and Jezebel pay the price for the sins of their parents. Now, some of these things we can understand. We get it. Some of them are really hard to understand. Really? Ahab's whole family has to get wiped out because of this? I don't get it. Some of you might even be thinking, well, what if some of these people were innocent? That's kind of strange. It's a little hard to swallow. And indeed, Jehu, as we saw, he went a little too far. Killing people, he should not be killing. And next week, we're going to see it has consequences. You'll get introduced to a queen. And again, really, did, Jahab, or did uh, Ahab's, <laughs> mixing two people, Jahab, did Ahab's whole family really have to die? There's an application here where we can acknowledge that, yes, some of the things that parents do will fall on their kids. It can have a negative effect on future generations. But in order to understand what's going on here from a biblical perspective, I want to draw your attention back to some of the verses that we looked at. I want you to notice something, and I'll explain this to you biblically and draw out an application. And just in case, well... <laughs> If, if your application today, your takeaway from the message was, gee, I really need to stop murdering so many people, this might not be the best fit for you. So <laughs> we're going to talk about something else. <laughs> Second kid. Uh, I might get myself killed. 2 Kings 10, starting at verse 28. In this way, Jehu destroyed every trace of Baal worship from Israel. He did not, however, destroy the gold calves at Bethel and Dan, with which Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had caused Israel to sin. Nonetheless, the Lord said to Jehu, You have done well in following my instructions to destroy the family of Ahab. Therefore, your descendants will be kings of Israel down to the fourth generation. Where is he getting that from? I want to explain a little something to you. We don't really talk about it a lot here. It doesn't really come up a lot here in this church, but I've heard it in Christianity, this concept of generational blessings or curses. You guys heard of that? Generational curses. And it took me a while to really hear about that. It wasn't until I ran into some like crazy Christians that I started hearing about this. But <laughs> generational curses. So it comes from the Old Testament, right? But I'm going to show you we're not under that anymore. It's not really a thing. But I'll explain to you kind of its origins and then help you get there. So this is basically we can be cursed because of something our family did, maybe down to the fourth generation. So if we go back to Exodus, a lot of you know the story of the giving of the Ten Commandments. So this is the initiation of the giving of the law. So you get your Ten Commandments, and then basically everything else is like an extrapolation from that, a continuation from that. So big, important event, what they celebrate on Pentecost. Remember that. So in that context, he's given them out. Don't have any other gods. But we get to 2, Exodus 24. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who 
reject me, but I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. Now, in the Old Testament, the Torah in particular, it's kind of important because it's repeated. It's about rejecting God. Numbers 14, remember they scout out the land and only Joshua and Caleb want to come back? Well, the same type, the type of thing is said in there. It's reiterated. Again, Deuteronomy 5, reiterated. It's important. Now, here's the thing. Some people, it took me a little bit to figure this out when I came into Christianity because I didn't get raised into non-denominational Christianity, so I'd see different things happen, and I didn't get it right away. But when I became a pastor, I caught on. A lot of people will use this to go beyond normal consequences that their parents did, like they got my family into trouble or something like that, well beyond it, to excuse their sin. I didn't realize that that was its purpose and reasoning. So they'll say things like, I'm cursed. That's it. My parents sinned. I have this generational curse. Uh Uh-huh. That's interesting. So they use it for all sorts of things, all kinds of sin and shortcoming. The biggest one might be addiction, right? So my father was an addict and he never recovered, so that's why I just can't recover from this. Interesting. Well, I have these sins. Oh, you know, everybody in my family, they all went to jail, so that's why I went to jail, right? They were thieves or whatever. So I just, I have this curse, this generational curse. It's just something that I do. And you can extend it even to other things, all kinds of other things that I've heard like why you might not have achieved certain things. Well, you know, it's my parents, or my parents were stupid, I'm stupid, whatever it is. But that's not what God says about you. That's the thing. I'm not not good looking. That's not what God says about you. I'm not smart. That's not what God says about you. Oh, I'm just a sinner. No, you're a saint. Did you know that? In the New Testament, when you see the word, when Paul's writing things like to all the saints, you read that? Holy, it's the same word in in Greek, agia. Holy, saints, that's what he's calling them. That's you, the church. I'm just a sinner. That's not what God says about you. Read it in context again before you use those verses. Romans 3. We have all sinned. It's not what God says about you. Furthermore, these curses, they're in the context, first of all, of the Old Testament. We're not under the law anymore. That's where they are, back there, in your past, where you got to put all that garbage behind you. It's in the past. I thought the law was garbage. But they're in the context of not obeying God, of idolatry. So think about it. It's what it is in Exodus, idolatry. Ahab and Jezebel. What does Jahab, Jay, <laughs> what does Jehu call her? I was getting serious there too. <laughs> Jehu calls her what? Jezebel. A cursed woman. That cursed woman. That's not you. Now, as it relates to other sins, well, actually, see, if we keep reading, the Bible says the opposite. It's kind of interesting. We're actually going to get there quick. In 2 Kings 14, we're going to see an interesting thing. Amaziah, there's assassination attempts. His dad assassinated assassination attempts against him, and he forgives it. And he says the opposite. The children don't get punished for the sins of their parents. Well, that's interesting. Do we have a contradiction? No. As we've learned, we need to keep reading, right? It clarifies as we go further. So if we jump ahead to another prophet, we get to Ezekiel. Ezekiel's doing the same type of thing Jeremiah's doing pronouncing judgment on them. But something interesting happens. There's this dialogue in Ezekiel 18, and it basically explains this whole thing in long form, Ezekiel 18. And the basic point, to make it short, is, well, you know, just because a father does something, if the son turns from it and corrects it, I'm not going to punish the son for that. And then it says this, because the audience might be confused. What, you ask? Doesn't the child pay for the parent's sins? No. For if the child does what is just and right and keeps my decrees, that child will surely live. The person who sins is the one who will die. The child will not be punished for the parent's sins, and the parent will not be punished for the child's sins. Righteous people will be rewarded for their own righteous behavior, and wicked people will be punished for their own wickedness. If we keep reading, we get some more clarification. 
Ezekiel 18.30, therefore I will judge each of you, O people of Israel, this is who is being talked to now, according to your actions, says the sovereign Lord. Repent and turn from your sins, don't let them destroy you. Put all your rebellion behind you and find yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O people of Israel? I don't want you to die, says the sovereign Lord. Turn back and live. Ah, If we keep reading... We get something very important. Ezekiel 36, 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. A future time he's talking about here. And you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away. And you will no longer worship idols. And I will give you a new heart. And I'll put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart. Like the tablets of stone the law was written on. And give you a tender, responsive heart. How? And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. And indeed, that is what happens in Acts on Pentecost. On that celebration, tablets of stone in the past, heart of flesh, a spirit-filled heart. If we go one more book further, Paul writes Romans. He's talking about struggle with sin. In chapter 7, a lot of people get that wrong. I can explain that one to you at Bible study and excuse away sin with that. But if that was the point, chapter 6 and 8 would make no sense. He's talking about a new life in the Spirit, Romans 8.1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. It's freed you from it. He gives this illustration about being a slave to sin previously. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us. By giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. See, if you didn't read that whole thing, you could have plucked out a little bit there, couldn't you? It's important to read the whole thing. You see, Jesus breaks the curse. We're not under these generational cycles or curses anymore. We're free by the power of the Holy Spirit. Free. Now, just a quick note. When we tend to look at these things, I'm going to share something personal with you. When we look at these things, we tend to look at the negative, right? And some people relate to the negative. Well, he did it. I do that too. But negative, negative, negative. We can't miss the positive. All the good that's in here, the fulfillment of these prophecies, what I just read to you. Don't stop on the bad. Read to the fulfillment. Keep moving forward. We tend to do that even in our own lives, don't we? We look at the negative. And we don't move forward. We spend our lives looking in the rearview mirror. You're going to crash if you do that. You've got to move forward. And learn to see if you do analyze your past. And this is something I've learned as I got older. This took me a long time. I want to save you some trouble. If you're older than me, sorry. (laughs) But I want to save you some trouble if you're doing this like I used to do this. I didn't have a good relationship with my family, especially with my father. It was really hard, really hard. I used to say of him, as I started to like mature, the best thing I could say was he was like fine wine in a paper cup. (laughs) Wonderful thing. Great advice sometimes, but horrible delivery. And that delivery would seem to cancel out all the good advice. Horrible. I became angry, hateful. I was a very angry young, so angry I had to lift a bunch of weights and become a martial arts professional. That's how angry I was, right? Left a career in music for that. But I was angry, angry, blaming him for everything. I could only see the paper cup. That's all I could see was the delivery. But when I came to Christ... He showed me the good. 
I started to see some of the good in there. I started to see some of the actual intentions going on there and realize that the anger, the hate, the blame had blinded me to the wisdom that was inside there. We get blinded to wisdom by all this blame. So through even the bad, sometimes we can see the good. Jesus helps us with that. We need to forgive. We need to move on. That's how it's done. Jesus' way leads to permanent restoration. Through Christ, we can clean house. Through Christ, we get a clean slate. As I close, you'll be told how you can connect with us. We try to make it really easy. So you can do that through our app. You can do that with like paper connection cards at the tables, or you can imagine this, talk to me. <laughs> we try to make that easy too. We're going to have fellowship right after the service today. But if that's you, you've been like, man, I am looking in the rear view mirror too much. If you're ready to move on, connect with us. We're not program church. We're people church. We love people. We do it by building one-on-one -on -one relationships. And so, yeah, you'll actually get a meeting with me. Or you'll get a meeting with Carol Lee or Heather or somebody here. We want to develop a relationship with you that leads to Christ, person to person. So that's why we have fellowship after the service. I encourage you to do that. Come up, see one of us. You're a little shy, fill out a connection card or online. You might want to renew your commitment to Christ. You might not have known Jesus before today. You're all important. We want to talk to each one of you. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for every single person who took the time to come in here today, everyone watching online. Lord, I pray that you just stir up hearts today. I pray that you lead people to turn, to surrender, so that they can receive your Holy Spirit and they, they can begin to live lives of joy, peace, love, kindness, patience, and self-control through you. Lord, we're just so grateful for your sacrifice that has made this all possible. We thank you. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.